I just believe that everyday Americans see things entirely different than the media. So the media, the left-wing media, is relegated to irrelevancy, and especially in the age of social media, where people can have a voice in an unconventional way. So I'm very hopeful for the future of our country. Hi again, everybody. Welcome into another episode of the Narrative Podcast. Mike Andrews, Aaron Baird, David Mahan, and yes, friends, David does still work at CCB. <laughs> He's still he here. is still part of our podcast. Love you guys. Exactly. We are grateful to have him back today. So stop all the fan mail to the narrative email inbox. He is here today, ready <laughs> he, to grace us with his presence. Still does exist around here, even though he's he, D- David. Uh, David's been off in the woods uh, getting a, a house ready and, and breaking his back. Like lit- I watched him walk into the office today. I said, "My back hurts just looking at you." Uh, Feels great doing real man work. Uh-huh. Yeah, I suppose sitting right here with you guys. That's the rest of the work. You guys. I was gonna say you're the one doing the other kind of work. Too. That's, <laughs> it's kind of a cell phone. Yeah, really. I was gonna say at the end of the day, you're Not the, the one argument that doing those is, things. Yeah. Well, a lot to talk about and get caught up on today as we take a few minutes to. To go through the news headlines, and one of the biggest ones over the last couple of weeks has been what's going on not too far from us down in Springfield, Ohio. And there's so much sensationalism going on around this with, with Trump coming out in the debates. <laughs> They're eating the dogs. They're eating the kids. Exactly. They turned out into a song. Did you hear that? They, <laughs> yes, they made a mix of it. It's a banger. It's, it's a really, really, really good song. Yeah. <laughs> but in spite of that, there's still some some real implications going on there for the residents of Springfield, yeah. for the Haitian immigrants that are there. There's a lot to wade through, so yeah. let's just kind of start with some knee-jerk reactions or or things that you've been thinking through and processing about as as you've heard more and more details come out about this story of what's going on in Springfield, Aaron. Yeah, you know, I think, you know, right out off the gate, the whole dog and cat thing. Um, there's a, a few different things that I I think there. Um, one, uh, it, it's astonishing to me for the media to uh, come out so certain on these things today and get so upset when people don't believe them. Uh, When over the last four years, we could go by, especially come election season, we can show story after story where they insisted the truth was one way and it turned out to be completely the other. Uh, Like it's so frustrating to me now, the the sort of condescending um, spirit they have towards a lot of folks. And at the end of the day, um, just like a lot of these stories, you have now, you know, after their, the, the initial media backlash against what Trump said, you do have stories coming out. Chris Rufo uh, published it. We saw public testimony of folks saying, hey, we're, we're seeing this in the community. It's, it's, we're concerned about it. All that to say, though, when you actually, when I've talked to people in Springfield, uh, actually, uh, Maria, my wife, just went out to Springfield for um, World Magazine to, to cover this on their the World and Everything in It podcast. Um, you know, you talk to the folks there. And they will tell you, listen, this is this is serious concerns. There's very terrible things happening here now because of bra- bad immigration policy, right? And and bad immigration policy takes a lot of different forms, right? It can take the form of an open border. Um, it can also take the form of overwhelming a city's social services uh, by dropping 20,000 people on a town of 60,000 in a span of 18 to 24 months. Um, and people who are from a vastly different culture, a third world culture at that. Um, and so when you when you actually talk to people uh, there, um, they will talk about, uh, yeah, you know, I, you know, the, the, the one mom I spoke to said, um, I don't feel right about letting my 17 year old uh, drive right now. It's, it's scary mm-hmm. out there because you have yeah. people driving around without driver's license that don't know the rules of the road um, and, and doing those. Things. You, you hear about. Uh, the welfare system, the hospitals, the schools being overwhelmed, right? And this is this is none of this of what we're saying here is necessarily a judgment on the Haitian people that are being brought over. Uh, it is a judgment on the the Biden and Harris uh, immigration policies uh, that are are just showed complete lack of care for the existing American citizens in those places um, that have been paying taxes and and have been living in these communities. Uh, and now are afraid to let their kids drive in the street. That's the real story. Um, I will say, you've, you you know, you get the two second clips of JD Vance saying something about uh, the cats and dog things, and it miss, and then they, the media leaves off the ten minutes he talks later about. Here's what my constituents are telling me they're seeing in the community, um, and that's the story they're trying to tell. That's the story I think we need to be telling 
um, because it's the thing that matters most when we think about the future of our country and the future of our communities. Yeah, Uh, they they grab onto that sensational bit and hand wave away anything else. Like there are those legitimate concerns that you just raised. Um, David, what's been been your take as you've processed through what's going on in Springfield or what you've heard? I I think that's a very balanced uh, way of putting it, Aaron. And and I think that... um, Trump could have probably did a better job. Uh, I'm just saying. We that, all right? agree that on the, the, the debate, just generally. <laughs> okay, Trump uh, could have done a better job in that debate. Because I'm thinking about all the kids, the Haitian kids, right, who are caught in the middle of all this uh, in in schools today, mm-hmm. um, who are getting the jokes and the bullying, and you know, um, that's that's I can't imagine, right? Yeah. And I think sometimes as a party, as you know, just Christians, like we got to be careful. Um, that we don't get caught up in in the whole partisan back and forth. The media puts out, um, so, you know, something on on one side, and then we have to be way over on the other side, um, just as ridiculous, just as childish sometimes. Um, and then here you have real people in the middle, right? Um, and again, it, it just goes back to to my human shields thing, right? That um, the the media likes to use people as human shields, and then we just keep firing at the people. Right, yeah. um, and we got to be careful not to do that. Yeah, yeah. no, that's, yeah. that's a good word. No, I, 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 again, I think um, this is this is what brings it back to um, behind every public policy is people, right? So when you have uh, when you have policies and you have uh, administrations enacting certain things. Um, there is a there's a, a human cost to it on all sides, right? I, I mean, again, you hear about the stories of I talked to folks out there um, who are Springfield residents that talk about you have one or two bedroom apartments that have 15, 16, yeah. 17 people living in them, right? That's that that again. That's where I would look at and say this is not loving your neighbor. And these aren't refugees; these are people here over on uh, on on temporary visas, right? Um, like the, there's a whole host of issues that go around here, and that was I, I did a conversation um, with Anna Staver at, at on NPR earlier this week, um, and she was she was asking about you know what's our what's the Christian nationalist perspective on this, and I said, well, <laughs> <laughs> take it easy. Um, First, but, I'm a lobbyist. Exactly, now I got to be a now Christian, gotta nationalist. Christian nationalist and all that, um, but. But I said, you know, again, at the end of the day, this is all a, a prudential conversation. Um, and you look at the situation that uh, the policies of the Biden-Harris administration has, has put us in, uh, and nobody is winning in this situation, right? Uh, least of which the kids, um, both the existing American citizen kids, which, mm-hmm. again, this is not a racial statement. This is not a nativist statement. This is just a... We as a country have an obligation to care for our people first, right? That's that is what this is, right? Um, and the reason why all of these people want to come to our country is because we do care for our people, right? And this is and, and the folks that are paying citizen, paying taxes, and the folks that are, you know, are, are invested in the in the communities. That that's a, a first obligation of our political leaders. And then when we start implementing these radical, uh, unthought through immigration policies, we put everyone at risk. Not least of which are the people that we're bringing over, but also the, our, our existing American citizens. Yeah, yeah, I couldn't agree more that it gets spun so much that just because we have criticisms of the process that resulted in this, right. that that we're criticizing the people specifically, oh. and it, it's actually a heart, uh, a heart of Christ to right. to want to love these people well and to welcome them into our communities and our states in a way that makes sense that doesn't overwhelm the infrastructure right that's like, in place. like my best friend is Haitian right and it's like I'm just playing that's right. you, have a, you have a best friend <laughs> that's, that's, that, that's the first thing we knew he was lying but again but I mean Mike think about this in in the inverse context think about dropping 20,000 Americans on a town of 60,000 in Haiti or a town of 60,000 in you know I don't know uh Hungary or whatever right um you would have the 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 systems would be massively overwhelmed we wouldn't know the laws. We wouldn't know. This, this is just, it makes for bad policy. Springfield, 40,000 people. It's about 60,000. 60, yeah. 60, yeah. So, I mean, that's like 25% increase in exactly. population. Right. Well, How actually, that's it? a third increase, but you're the comps director. Well, we don't expect you, you to know math. Not. Ma- math Mike does is hard. Exactly. Mike doesn't balance the books. <laughs> two plus two books is are up chicken. here. Exactly. <laughs> right. <laughs> exactly. Uh, but, but uh, again, th- th- this is, 
And actually, I'm really excited. I'm, I'm, I'm bummed tonight that I, I can't be there tonight. Um, uh, our, our friend of the show, Vivek Ramaswamy, is doing an event, and we're recording this on Thursday. This will get posted tomorrow. Um, but is doing an event in a town hall in uh, Springfield. Um, and of all people like to go and do an event, like I love Vivek going because he'll have an honest conversation, yeah. right? And and we'll engage with different thoughts. And um, I'm actually excited to see how that all goes because um, it is a it, it's this is maybe the perfect picture of of what bad uh, policy does. When speaking of some bad policies, uh, we're taking on a. A yeah. company that's had some bad policies. This yeah. was kind of a uh, surprise announcement this week <laughs> as David shakes his head. The uh, nationwide not on your side campaign Heck that yeah. CCB rolled out this week. And uh, I got to spend some time with with my friends at the Farm Science Review yeah. going around and asking some questions about about nationwide. And uh, Aaron, just explain what's what's behind this and why CCB is getting involved in this particular issue. Yeah, absolutely. And again, I, I would... Uh, honestly say in this situation must much like the situation we have uh, in Springfield, it all comes back to public policy, right? Um, I think for a lot of folks, well, l- let me just give broader context first and foremost. I think we've all seen actually next week, we're going to talk to Daniel Cameron uh, from the 1792 exchange, former uh, Kentucky attorney general about all these companies that have been backing out of their DEI policies, uh, the corporate equality index, uh, and companies like Tractor Supply, John Deere, Lowe's, Ford, uh, Coors Molson, um, Harley Davidson, cu- companies that have very conservative and you know predominantly Christian customer bases, but are pushing very leftist, progressive policies. Right? Um, you've seen this sort of all these companies backing out, saying, "Hey, we're just going to stick to serving our customers." Well, Nationwide is much like all of those companies. Right? Uh, a, they they came out of the Ohio Farm Bureau. Um, they have they position themselves very conservatively in certain parts of the state, but politically they are one of the most leftist progressive org- uh, companies in the country. Um, so that's 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 like the the baseline here. Let me tie this back to policy though, very specifically on why we did this. Nationwide insurance is a stronger force for LGBT ideology in Ohio than Planned Parenthood and the ACLU combined. Um, and I know that sounds crazy to folks, but let's just be honest here. If we have super majorities of Republicans in the state house in Ohio, we have all statewide office holders are Republicans in Ohio. If Planned Parenthood or the ACLU or Equality Ohio, if they book a meeting with a Republican, they're not going to get very far, right? They might take the meeting, but the conversation's not going to go very far. If Nationwide books the meeting, you better believe That's right. they're taking that meeting, Right. If Nationwide books that meeting, they're coming in, they, they, they're going to hear it. So when Nationwide books a meeting and walks in and says, hey, we think you should support the bill that allows men in women's bathrooms. We think you should support the bill that would allow boys to play in girls' sports. We think, hey, by the way, these bills that you're working on to protect the privacy of kids, to protect unborn life, to protect religious freedom. Health of children. To protect the health of children. We th- think these things are bad for business. Um, those Republicans are going to be much more likely to listen to Nationwide. We think, by the way... Uh, well, I'll let David say that, share the thing about uh, the, the hospitals here, but th- this is the the this is one of these things. As you know, the, the Christian public policy group that's on Cap Square, we see things behind the scenes here that most folks would be shocked to know, right? And I think for especially the farming community in Ohio, folks outside of 270, they see nationwide as the oh, aw shucks, Peyton Manning. Uh, you know, good farming insurance company. They're the largest insurer of farmers. They'd be shocked to know that this is the way that Nationwide acts at the state house. Um, and so uh, we decided we we needed to let folks know because Nationwide has become such a force for really dangerous public policy. Yeah, you know, for years, and you've been hearing us say this on the narrative, um, when most people realized that Nationwide Children's was at the tip of the spear of all this gender transition stuff for children, you know, six clinics, you know, at least six clinics here in the state of Ohio and all over the country, just the tip of the spear. The first thought was, I was like, wow, you know, man, my kid, you know, had to go to children's and, and, and we're just saying, just get out of this gender game. Like, just get out of this woke stuff. And I know when you hear statements like what Aaron just said, that they are more um, influential on these issues than Planned Parenthood and Equality Ohio. I actually did, you know, I want to bring the receipts to that. Um, Nationwide insurance in Columbus, 
received a 100 uh, score from the human rights campaign. Planned Parenthood of Southwest Ohio received a 95. <laughs> How in the world are you more woke than Planned Parenthood? That, I didn't even realize that's yeah, really that's good. insane. Oh that's insane. And so, so that's a, your pe- people just need to know. And that's really all we're trying to do is letting folks know where they are is not where we are. Right. And and the only way for them to move back to where we are and support their constituents is for people to know. And and let, let's even be clear too, just because I, I know this is what you're saying here. We're not looking for nationwide to give CCB money. We don't want nationwide's money, right? I, I would like money. You would like money. I, that's that's just, true. I'm gonna just be just real. generally speaking, <laughs> right? So David is for sale. If you guys would like, you could <laughs> anyway uh, get him for two pence. Exactly right. Uh, but. We just want nationwide to stay neutral, right? Get out of these culture wars. Sell things, insurance. Right? Sell insurance, right? We're, and, and and honestly, too, let, let me be clear here. We don't even care if the individual board members or executives, if they want to be given to, you know, crazy woke causes. This is this is not what we're, we're, we're out here saying, hey, you per, like we're, we're not targeting p- people. We're saying this company is leveraging its influence, it leveraging its force to drive public policy that's harmful to families. And so what we're asking and what we're calling on is that, uh, hey, get out of woke politics, drop out of the corporate equality index for goodness sake. That's that's not helping you serve one more farmer uh, in any way that's actually useful. That's not helping you serve your employees. You can serve all of your employees very well, uh, no matter who they like to have sex with. Um, it doesn't matter. Uh, you can do all of that just fine. Um, but without having to be driving these kind of crazy and sponsoring agendas, sponsoring pride parades, yeah, I mean, in oh, front that's, of children, like that's the. I mean, why in the world is Nationwide Insurance giving tens of thousands of dollars to Stonewall Columbus every year, an organization that hosts drag queen story hours, right? I mean, this is this is what they are investing in in the state, and so uh, I mean, again, with the the man on the street interviews we did. Um, for those of you who didn't see, we flew a plane over the Farm Science Review. <laughs> we Find our, our social channels. You'll be able You'll to go see back all and the see videos. all the stuff. It's, yeah. it's hilarious uh, and awesome. Um, uh, we we have text messaging, and we're just getting started. Like this is this is going to be an ongoing drumbeat um, until. And just for the record, that was not my phone. My phone was silenced. I think that was David. So Claire is looking over. David's got to buy lunch now because uh, wait a minute, wait a minute, he just, it's not uh, been confirmed. <laughs> yeah, I, 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 we just I just saw you turn okay, off. The sound. All right, it has been confirmed. <laughs> <laughs> I will be buying Claire lunch. That's good. Uh, but yeah, well, and and just real quickly on the corporate equality index, I I think it's worth pointing out too that it's just this series of hoops that companies really have to go out of their way to get involved in these incredibly left leaning. Uh, causes and stuff like that to get that high score. But then also HRC keeps moving the goalpost on yeah. it, as we've said before too. Like it's only going to drive companies further and further left if they don't get out of it now. And and I think that's worth mentioning too. Uh, no, it's it's total mob tactics, Mike. I mean, where where these these HRC comes in and says, Hey, are you discriminating against LGBT people? You know, your clients, your your uh, employees um, and it's like, oh, of course not. Well, then here, here's what you need to do to, to be able to show that you're a, you're a good employer. You're a good business. Um, which, again, by the way, these these guys are the biggest moralists out there, right? They, they always are accusing us of forcing our worldview on people. And, like, they're literally doing this with this thing. Um, but then every year they update. Like you said, they, they update. Oh, well, this is what it actually means. And you look at the, the, the criteria. And, like, some of the criteria are do you, do you support and sponsor uh, LGBT events um, at, in your local community, right? I mean, it, it's 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 legitimately mob tactics with the things that they're doing here. Um, and so, again, this is everything that we're saying is factual. We have receipts on all of it. Um, and th- at the end of the day, all we're asking for Nationwide to do is don't be driving these political agendas because that that makes you an, uh, an opponent to the family. That makes you an opponent to the thriving of the state. And that makes you something that CCV has to speak out against. Nationwide, not on your side.com if you want to see some of those receipts for yourself. And also, again, CCV's social media channels. We're pretty much uh, at CCV policy across the board on, on any of the major social networks. So uh, find us there to see those man on the street interviews and stuff that we'll continue to, to roll out. Uh, last thing before we intro our special, 
I guess we'll call it a guest today, even <laughs> though we're not actually doing an interview. But uh, Cleveland Gala was this past yeah. weekend. We had our friend Kaylee McEnany in, and what a great night! And and I'm excited to be able to share this audio with our listeners today because I thought I thought she knocked it out of the park. It, it was a, a great series of, of remarks that she gave us in Q and A with you. Just a, a really, I thought one of the best. Uh, best examples of how you integrate faith and public life that, that I've heard in a while. No, I, I had that sort of same thought, Mike, because I have a lot of, um, it's one of the more common questions we get around here of, you know, where do we go for, for news today to, to actually find out the facts, all these types of things, who are the voices that we turn to that we can trust? Um, and it's a hard question, right? And, and we, I mean, this was a special one for us because we had Kaylee McEnany speak at our galas back in, Cincinnati and Columbus probably three years ago. Um, and that was right when we rolled out the school planting initiative and all these things. And it was, you know, we were, I think, I don't know, Claire, what do we have, eight employees uh, at the time, something like that. And so to, to have Kaylee there for that to show, hey, look, this is this is what the Lord has done um, was was really cool. But to have to hear Kaylee up there and to hear her heart, um, both for the Lord but also for our nation, um, was just such a stark reminder that there are some good People out there in the media today, um, really uh, trying to trying to expose uh, darkness, uh, trying to to be truthful in their reporting, uh, in their in their commentating, um, and was encouraging for me. Right, I, I think um, at the end of the day, um, you know, folks like uh, Kaylee, you can very clearly tell that God has put them in this position for such a time as this. Yeah. Well, Kaylee McEnany's. Comments from the 2024 Cleveland Gala are coming up next on The Narrative. Hey, Narrative listeners. You know, Christians in the marketplace today face more unique and challenging threats than ever before. Businesses are following woke capitalism, chambers of commerce are beholden to social justice, and secular activists are chipping away Christians' First Amendment rights. As Ohio's only Christian chamber of commerce, the Christian Business Partnership stands in the gap to advocate for, to educate, and to celebrate Christian business owners. Joining the partnership also allows businesses to provide their employees with health care insurance, workers' compensation, and exclusive banking and educational discounts. To find out more and to join, go to cbpohio.org. That's cbpohio.org. Wow, thank you. Thank you so much. What a kind introduction. I, I'm humbled and honored by it. And I guess we need to take that CNN line out of my bio, although I was the conservative on CNN as a, a little disclaimer there. But what an honor to be back at the Center for Christian Virtue. After I left the White House podium, the very first speech I ever did was at CCV with Aaron Bear. Uh, my first two, actually. And what an amazing, incredible organization. And to be back now, three years later and see the dreams and the vision that Aaron had fully executed and in the process of being rolled out, it's it's amazing, amazing to see. So thank you, Aaron, for having me. CCV is one of the best organizations in the nation and to be here is very humbling. But a little about me, um, for those of you who may not know, I'll tell you a little bit about my journey to the White House. You know, I'm Florida, born and raised, It's, it's home to me. And at the time um, of working on the Trump campaign, I was in DC, so the swamp. So I'm I'm in the swamp and then all of a sudden, COVID-19 hits and like that, everything locks down. But prior to that moment, I had been on the campaign trail and you know, we were going to New Hampshire and South Carolina and all of the places you would go in a Republican primary. And I'm going around the country with my little daughter. She was only a few months old. My mom was coming with me and we were turning hotels into like makeshift baby nurseries and cleaning her clothes in the, in the little hotel bathtub and having a makeshift crib in the corner. And I'd go out to the Trump rally and I'd come back. And that's what we did for a few months. And then, as I mentioned, COVID hits. And I, I go back to my home state of Florida, which if you have to lock down, I will say being locked down in Florida was, was a great place to be. It's, it's a wonderful state. So I'm in Florida. And unbeknownst to me, a few weeks into being there, I get this call. And I had received a few calls from the White House before. And when your phone lights up, it's like an odd series of numbers, numbers you hadn't seen before. And you can kind of tell this is a a weird number calling me, and it might be the White House switchboard. I'd received maybe two, three calls maximum at that moment in time, and I remember exactly where I was. 
I'm going over this bridge in Florida. My daughter is in the back seat with me, just a few months old. My mom's driving, and I say, Mom, I think the President of the United States might be calling me. I go, I gotta take this. So I answer, and they say, this is the White House switchboard. We have President Trump here for you. Can you take his call? Well, of course I'm taking his call. So I take this pink pacifier, I put it to my daughter's lips, I answer the phone, I don't know why he's calling me, pray for the best, and he said, I have a question for you, and I said, what's that? And he said, would you like to be my White House press secretary? It was quite a question, and I said, without hesitation, that would be the honor of my lifetime. And he said something like, Mark, get it done, and I think he meant Mark Meadows, the chief of staff, go get it done. And Mark Meadows indeed got it done, and I set out on this journey a few weeks later to go back to D.C. to take this enormous job. It was very surreal. I had been a White House intern in the Bush administration, and I would remembered standing in the back of the press briefing room watching Dana Perino give a press briefing, never thinking I'd be called to do that very job just about 10 years or so later. So I, I'm really humbled by this opportunity, and my husband says, you know, we should drive up. So we decided to drive up uh, the Eastern Corridor. I didn't want to be caught on a plane. I thought if I was caught on a plane, the press would be like, the new press secretary endangering the life of the president during COVID. You know, they like to write those sensational headlines. So we decided to drive up in his truck, and we're driving up, and I'm thinking about how am I going to do this job? And I'm researching, I'm trying to find academic journal articles on how to be a good press secretary. There's like one that exists, and I read it. I'm calling past press secretaries, I'm calling people in the administration, I'm trying to figure this out. And then my dad texted me, Kaylee, maybe you're here for such a time as this. And I believe if God wants you to hear a message, sometimes he will send it twice, and sometimes through two very different sources, because you can't get more different than my dad ideologically, than CNN's Van Jones, who texted me a few weeks into the job, Kaylee, maybe you're here for such a time as this. And I know it was something I was meant to hear. I know it's something that is not just meant for me, but for all of us in this room. So I take this job, and I wonder if I'll ever give a press briefing, because it had been more than 400 days since any press secretary had given a briefing. I believe the last one was by Sarah Sanders, more than 400 days before I got there. So I wonder if he'll ask me to do a briefing. And then one day, it was a Wednesday, President Trump says, I want you to do a briefing. And I'm like, OK, I need to get a notebook together. I need some time. You know, the notebook was interesting. It became a subject of interest to reporters. In fact, they had a camera behind me. And they would take pictures of my binder. And CNN literally had an article decoding the mysteries of Kaylee McEnany's briefing binder. There was no mystery. The, the topics were like COVID, therapeutics, whatever the topics of the day were. Although we did think one day we would change those titles to you know, John, Carl, Jim Acosta, give them each a tab so that they knew they were on notice. We, we didn't get to do that, and that was a regret. But anyway, the president says this on Wednesday. I want you to do a briefing. Then he says it again on Thursday. And then Thursday afternoon, he says, do a briefing and do it before Monday. So that left Friday. So I had to go to the podium to do this briefing, and I put in all of the work. We would sit around in my office by this wood-burning fireplace, and we would stay there till 9, 10 o'clock sometimes, preparing for these briefings. But more important than the academic preparation was the spiritual preparation. I went home, I listened to a Joyce Meyer sermon about faith over fear. I tweeted out Philippians 4.13, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I listen to Christian music, and then I go in for my first briefing on May 1st, 2020. And I'm sitting there in the office, and I'm getting texts throughout the day from people around the nation saying that they had been praying for me. And then I get a text from my predecessor, Sarah Sanders, and she sent me a list of advice. And her final piece of advice was this, most importantly, pray. Let God carry you through the tough times and give you strength when you don't have any wisdom. And she told me that she read her Jesus Calling devotional every time before she went to the podium. And that's something that I carried on as a tradition. We also prayed together as the team. It was the last thing we did before I went out there. But she sent me that day her Jesus Calling devotional from exactly two years prior. And here's what it said. You are on the path of my choosing. There's no randomness about your life. As you give yourself more and more to a life of constant communion with me, you will find that you simply have no time to worry. But I worried that day, I'm human. <laughs> and I was so worried, my, my uh, secretary came in and said, I've got your parents on speakerphone and we prayed together. And I went to the Oval Office and the president was there. And his private dining room, there was the vice president there and Jared Kushner and the vice president said he had been praying for me. 
And I walked to the private West Wing bathroom, got on my knees, said a prayer, walked to the podium, and I kid you not, when I stood there, a total serenity came over me as if I had been standing there my whole life. And it is not anything I did. It was because there were millions of men and women of faith across this country who prayed for our administration. And if you were among them, I want to thank you because I am a testament to your prayers. So thank you very much. But I want to focus briefly before Aaron and I sit down and have a discussion on an issue that I know is near and dear to CCV's heart. We heard about the incredible work CCV does in the field of education and protecting our young women and the transgender issue, but I know CCV also cares very deeply about the issue of life. And when I think about my path to the podium, it's really the issue of life that got me there because you know, my worldview, my dad used to, when I grew up, he would say, you know, what's your worldview, what's your worldview? I'm like, dad, what's this worldview thing? I don't even know what you're saying. And then when I went over to Harvard and Georgetown, I, I learned very quickly what a worldview was and it was very different than mine at these universities. But politically, you know, I developed my views listening to Rush Limbaugh in my dad's truck. I, I loved listening to the late, great Rush Limbaugh. But more importantly than my political ideas were my faith. I grew up in a Southern Baptist church. I walked down the aisle. I gave my life to Christ. And what I found with the issue of life is where politics and our faith meet really at the central crossroads of that is the issue of life. The Bible speaks to me most pertinently to the issue of life of any issue that we face today. The Bible is unequivocally clear where we as Christians must stand on that issue. And it was a, a great, great feat when Roe v. Wade was overturned by Dobbs. But let me tell you, you know, while we can celebrate that, there are 63 million, now it's more than that, children who have died across this country to the scourge of abortion. That's about one-fifth of the current U.S. population. Think about that, one-fifth of the population just gone. That is the damage that Roe did and that continues to be done at the state level. And I remember when the Biden White House was asked, Jen Psaki, who came after me, is a baby a baby at 15 weeks? A baby at 15 weeks is moving rapidly, has arms and legs, the baby's eyes are closed, but the baby can sense light. The baby has a separate DNA code, that happens from day one. A baby can feel pain at 15 weeks, but the Biden White House would not say if a baby is a baby. It was deeply disappointing. But when you think about where we've come and you think about Roe, what happened before Roe was an issue that really animated my high school years, and it was the issue of partial birth abortion. And it wasn't too long ago when partial birth abortion was the law of the land legal across the country, and that's the killing of an infant coming outside of the womb. And I want to remind everyone, I used to read the majority opinion, but it will, will make you shudder in revulsion when you hear it. So instead, I read what the dissenting opinion was from that very big decision upholding partial birth abortion. And it was the late Justice Scalia. Here's what he said. I am optimistic enough to believe that one day Stenberg v. Carhart, that was the decision, will be assigned to its rightful place in the history of this court's jurisprudence beside Korematsu and Dred Scott. The method of killing a human, human child, one cannot even accurately say an entirely unborn human child proscribed by this statute, statute is so horrible that the most clinical description of it evokes a shudder of revulsion. Think about what he's saying there. Our abortion laws in this country are like Korematsu, which upheld Japanese internment camps, and Dred Scott, which upheld slavery. That is where our abortion jurisprudence has been in this country. And it was very powerful when you listen to the oral arguments about, uh, in Dobbs. Justice Roberts, Chief Justice Roberts said that, and I had to look this up, I had to fact check the Chief Justice because I couldn't believe it, that our abortion laws are on the same plane as North Korea and China. And he's right, we are one of seven countries in the world, think about this, in the world that allows elective abortion after 20 weeks. One of seven with North Korea and China. That's where we are as a country, and that's why we need moral leadership on this issue. When President Biden was asked about this issue, he said that he's a Catholic, and his church no longer believes that anymore. I'm a Southern Baptist, but I went to Catholic school my whole life. My husband's Catholic. We switched back and forth between Catholic and, I guess I go to a Pentecostal church now, so both. And I can tell you, I know Catholic catechism better than our Catholic president. Because Catholic catechism is unmistakable. Since the first century, the church has affirmed the moral evil of every procured abortion. This teaching has not changed and remains unchangeable. But as a country, we're at a place where people deny truth, whether it's the trans issue, whether it's what's going on in our schools, whether it's the issue of life. 
I'll never forget when Stacey Abrams came out and said that she's the twice failed gubernatorial candidate in Georgia. She said, there's no such thing as a heartbeat at six weeks. It is a manufactured sound designed to convince people that men have the right to take control of a woman's body. Okay. Ho, ho, ho. Okay. I was pregnant at the time with my second child. I had just been to the doctor, the OBGYN, at five weeks, and I saw the heartbeat. I heard the heartbeat. My husband was sitting there, and I can tell you there was not a cabal of doctors putting in a heartbeat to convince me that my husband controlled my body. I mean, what was Stacey Abrams saying? It was unscientific, and I thought, I thought we believed in science, the holy grail of science. Well, the March of Dimes, uh, the National Institute of Health, the Mayo Clinic all say that there is a heartbeat at six weeks. But what was interesting is what happened after Stacey Abrams' statement. She makes that statement in contravention of the science, but what happens? So Planned Parenthood changed their website in and about that time to say that there wasn't a heartbeat, just the basic beating sound of something. You'd expect that from Planned Parenthood. But here's what happened on social media, and this is so important. This was pre-Elon Musk, so this is back in the darker days of Twitter. And here's what Twitter did. So there's a trending section on Twitter, and it's supposed to be whatever's being talked about most that day. And they used to have a description as to why that topic was being talked about. Well, they had on Twitter's website, Stacey Abrams, and then underneath it's supposed to be this agnostic description, just very bare bones. Here was the description as to why she was trending. GA gubernatorial candidate Stacey Abrams said there's no such thing as a fetal heartbeat at six weeks of pregnancy, and doctors agree one does not exist during this early stage of pregnancy, reports from NBC News and NPR confirm. Do you see what's happened there? <laughs> Social media mainstream media and the scientific community all coming together to bury truth and to say that there is not a heartbeat. That is what we're up against. And look, the work has just begun on this issue. I know Roe has been overturned, and you here in Ohio know that very well. Aaron Baer, he is, he's such a leader. We've kept in touch over the last three years, and you know I've had conversations with him on, unfortunately, what happened with Ohio issue one. I know a lot of you in this room cared deeply and, and didn't want that to pass, but indeed it did, and these, these abortion ballot initiative, initiatives are so tricky. Aaron flagged for me where it says, every individual has a right to make and carry out one's own reproductive decisions. Notice, they didn't say adult, they said individual. This opens the door to minors having abortions. And when you go further, Ohio Issue 1 said, but in no case may such an abortion be prohibited if in the professional judgment of the pregnant patient's treating physician, physician it is necessary to protect the pregnant patient's life or health. That is abortion until birth, so long as you get a doctor to sign off on it. We're battling this down in Florida. We have our own uh, ballot initiative. It's called Amendment 4. Thankfully, the president came out and said he will be voting no on Amendment 4. President Trump said he will be voting no. Amendment 4 is exactly what you dealt with on Issue 1. But the victory we've had in Florida is that underneath that flowery, beautiful language will be a description as to exactly what this leads to, taxpayer-funded abortion. So we are hopeful that Florida may be the first state where the pro-life movement wins. We will see, but it's an extremely, extremely important thing. You know, as I close here, I do want to say this. I think on the issue of life, we know it's a political hot potato. We know the left is using it in a way that's politi politically powerful. But let me just suggest to you, we should not back down from this issue, and CCV does not. And here's what we need to do in order to win on the issue of life. Number one, we cannot hide from the issue. We must embrace the issue and talk about the issue. And we've seen that here in Ohio. Governor DeWine passed a six-week heart, six heartbeat bill. He signed it into law, and he went on to win re-election. We saw this in Georgia with Governor Kemp. Same thing, six-week heartbeat bill went on to win re-election. We must talk about the issue and not hide from it. Number two, we must expose the extremity of the left. Did anyone watch the debate last week? I'm sure that you did. Lindsay Davis, the moderator, her first fact check was to say that late-term abortion does not happen and is not illegal in any, and is illegal in every state in the country. Well, I just heard from your state senator that eight Democrats voted to not keep babies alive after birth. So I don't know if ABC needs a crash course on this, but maybe they should go to Tim Walz's Minnesota, where eight babies were left to die, and then he changed the reporting requirements so that that number is no longer reported. This is what we're up against, a media that is willing to lie, and we must expose this extremity of the left. And I would love if there's another debate for President Trump to look at Kamala Harris and say, 
You're a big proponent of abortion. Can you tell me the week at which a baby feels pain? Do you think she could answer that question? No, she could not. We need to expose the extremity of the left. And then finally, and this is the most important point that I think oftentimes we miss, final point, we must make sure that we love the mother as much as the baby. We must make sure we love the mother as much as the baby. Marco Rubio, that's a guy who's on it, let me tell you. Two days after Dobbs came out, he put out a 12-point plan to help women have economic choice during pregnancy. Because look, the left, you're, you're the party of choice. Well, does a woman really have a choice if she doesn't feel she has the support and resources to care for the baby she loves? Because we know women love their babies, we know that. So let's give women economic choice, let's empower them with a 12-point plan Marco Rubio put forward, all private sector solutions, not government programs, to help women afford life. That has to be the key tenet of our movement, supporting the woman as much as we support the child. Because the Bible is, let me, let me say this, we must get to a heart change in our country, and that's at, at the root of this issue. We have, a, have to view life the way the Bible views life. And the Bible's unmistakably clear, Luke 12, 7, indeed the very hairs of, on your head are all numbered. Do not be afraid, you are worth more than many sparrows. Think about that, God knows the number of hairs on your head. That is how much he loves you. That is how much he loves the unborn. Jeremiah 1.5, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I set you apart. I appointed you as a prophet to the nations. Job 31.15, the scripture goes on and on. But finally, let me end here. You know, I, I talk about walking down the aisle and giving my life to Jesus Christ, and that's when I became a Christian. But let me tell you a little bit about when my faith became real to me. I had just left college at Georgetown University, and I go um, into New York City. What a fun place to live in Manhattan. We were first job living in a windowless apartment, like facing a brick wall, very dark. But I had a great job. I worked for Governor Huckabee, which is wild, because looking back, you know, this is long before Trump was on the horizon, and Sarah Sanders was there, and I'm there, and we both went on to be press secretaries for the former president. But I'm in this job, and I'm loving my job, but I was going through kind of a depressing time. My pastor at the time at the Journey Church said, you know, Manhattan is millions of people everywhere, but it can feel like a very lonely place, and that's definitely how I was feeling. And I was going at the time through a bad breakup, which in hindsight is laughable, because I had the best husband ever, but at the time it felt huge. So I go back to my windowless apartment, and I'm trying to call my mom, whoever will answer the phone, no one's answering. And my phone rings, and it's a number I don't know, and I'm like, I'm gonna answer this. And I, just before this, this call came in, I said, God, if you're there, I need to hear from you. So I'm like, I'll answer this phone number. I don't care if it's a telemarketer, I'll talk to them. <laughs> so I answer, but it wasn't a telemarketer. It was someone from the Journey Church saying, we feel like we need to pray for you. How can we pray for you? And let me tell you, it is a very cool and amazing thing to get a call from the President of the United States saying, will you be my press secretary? But the greatest call I ever got in my life is a call from the risen Savior through one of his emissaries here on earth. It's a call I'll never forget. And I tell you that because I believe my life, you know, I'm in a, for such a time as this moment, we all are. And there are some people in this room, and I just want to acknowledge two of them that I believe are in just such a moment. One of them, and let me say this, you have the best solicitor general in the nation. And Elliot Geyser. I, I got to know Elliot in the final year of the Trump administration. He is one of the most brilliant people I have ever met. And if he is the person defending the incredible legislation CCV has pushed over the finish line, you are in very good hands. Elliot, you are in here for such a time as this moment. And then finally, Aaron Baer. I am so impressed with Aaron Baer and CCV. My mom came with me to the event I did, that very first speech I gave with Center for Christian Virtue. And she looked at me after and she goes, Kaylee, I've said over and over again, I am so tired of everyone just complaining about how bad things are. For the first time in my life, I heard someone have answers. I saw someone doing something. I saw someone making a difference. That is who Aaron Bear is. That is what CCV has done. Uh, and it is an honor to be here. I am incredibly proud of the work you've done and even to just be a part of it in this small way. I'm humbled and honored. So thank you so much, Aaron, and I look forward to our conversation.
<laughs> well, thank you, Kaylee. And you'll need to turn the mic on there uh, for him. Uh, well, Kaylee, that, that uh, gala that you came to uh, with us in Cincinnati and Columbus, um, you, you talked about uh, that night how in your office you put up two words uh, on your office, uh, on, on your wall. Uh, and uh, uh, there were so many things that night that stuck with me, that's carried with it, but that, that in particular, that mindset, the two words were offense only. And, and for us, again, right now, I think for, for conservatives and for Christians, we, a lot of times when we're talking about the, the work we're doing, we'll talk about protect and defend and, and the, these sort of defensive ideas as opposed to, no, we need to be going on offense right now. So for Christians and, and for, for those of us who are concerned about where the culture is, what does it look like to go on offense right now? What are, what, what are the things that we need to be, and even going into this election, how should we be going on offense and how we're talking about issues today? Yeah, the, the phrase on my wall was offense only. My dad said to come up with a motto for your press shop and, and that was the motto. Um, look, I think when we think about offense only as Christians, number one, we need to share our worldview with our friends and neighbors. Are how we became a Christian, how you became a person of faith, where you're coming from as a person, as a human being. Um, and then you can begin to have, you know, conversations. Everyone has their political viewpoint, but coming from a place of love um, and having those conversations and being bold enough to have those conversations. We were just talking at our table about how we, most people are on our side. You put up the polling on this issue, the, the transgender issue. Yeah. And what's interesting is there was some polling, I, I believe it was Washington Post KFF, and they put out the results of their poll, the vast majority of their results, early in the year. It was like January. This was, I think it was either one or two years ago. They buried the transgender polling and let it out kind of under the radar several months later. And it showed what you showed. 70% of people agree with truth, that, that biological women should not be competing against biological men. But it's hard to say these truths in the society we live in. So I think coming from a place of love, being bold is very important. And then on these issues, owning these issues, you know, the, we have great plans in the Republican Party. I mentioned to you the Providing for Life Act. We have a plan to support women during pregnancy. Marco Rubio has a private sector-based paid family leave plan. Um, we can win on these issues, but we've got to own the issues and say, here is our plan. Um, on the issue of school shootings, which, which break my heart and news every single time I have to cover them. Another example is of being on offense on these issues is the Safe Schools Act, which Marsha Blackburn has, which what the Safe Schools Act does is put security in our nation's schools. You know, we protect our diamonds at Tiffany's with armed guards, why not our children? And on a debate stage, I'd love for Trump to look at Kamala and say, the nation doesn't know this, but you're against security in schools. You've said that. Will you call on your party today in this moment to pass the Safe Schools Act to protect our children like we protect our diamonds at Tiffany's? You know, owning issues with solutions is the answer. Good. I, I want to talk real, a little bit more about the issue of life that, that you brought up. And, um, and again, I think for a lot of us, there, I can look around this room and see so many folks that poured not just time, but incredible resources into trying to fight that uh, abortion amendment. and. Um, we're, we're saying, okay, now we're going to be the blueprint for how to repeal these things. And I, I just want to acknowledge real quickly, um, the CCV, uh, we're, we're all out to, to repeal this abortion amendment one day. We actually just hired Peter Range, the former CEO of Ohio Right to Life, as our senior, uh, senior strate our strategic fellow, senior fellow for strategic initiatives. Uh, and Peter's going to be leading this effort for us to, to rebuild a culture here. Um, but as you're talking, we also have a number of folks that are running for office here. As, as you're talking to candidates, how should uh, political leaders today be talking about the issue of life, be talking about abortion? How can they go on offense with this today? Yeah, it's a great question. And the sad reality is we've lost every single ballot initiative post dots yeah. every single one. Um, and unfortunately, that leads to taxpayer-funded abortion because Planned Parenthood comes in with a class action lawsuit and they have these egregious policies that the vast majority of the nation does not support. You know, most, most elected officials, I find, like to hide from the issue. I mean, I imagine the reporter going down the hall of Congress, and if it's an, a day where life is the issue, they're, they're running the other way. We, we can't run from this issue. We need to own it. And 
There is a statue, and I wish we could put a picture of this statue in every single elected official's office that's on the Republican side of the aisle. It's a beautiful statue, and it's of a woman who has had an abortion, and she's holding Jesus' hand, and Jesus is holding her child, and she's looking down with shame and sadness, and he's holding her child and holding her hand. That is the image we need in our mind when we talk about these issues. Issues, And it occurred to me, you know, my, it kind of went off in my mind that we don't talk about the issues from this place of love. When I was talking to Governor DeSantis, and he said in an interview I did with him, most women want to keep their baby. And I went and looked at the statistics, and you and I were talking about them. 70% of women feel coerced into having an abortion because they don't have the financial resources or the support. So if we approach this from a place of love, we know women want to keep their baby, and we want to give you a true choice to keep the baby that we know that you love. We know that you love that baby, and here's how we're giving you a choice. Take the other side's word and turn it around on them. And one component of this is the Unborn Child Support Act. We believe a baby is a baby from the moment of conception, so men should pay women child support from the moment of conception. We should own that. That should be our rallying cry. We should ask Kamala to get behind that. So that, that is how you approach it from a place of love. Um, we know women love their babies, and here's how we're going to support you to choose life. Yeah. So you got uh, an inside glimpse of, of, of who President Trump is, right? I think for a lot of us, we, we see the, the reality TV star and then the, the, the guy that you know, is, is doing the big rallies and, and all of these types of things. But can you just talk a little bit about, one, the man you got to know serving in there, but also, two, you know, President Trump is a, a, a New York commercial real estate billionaire, right? He, he's not coming, he, he probably, not that I know of, had the experience in a Southern Baptist church of walking down the aisle to, to you know, that, that very uh, that ex powerful experience you had. So how did he especially relate to you and to others in the administration uh, that were strong Christians and that were called to prayer? What was that relationship like? Yeah, I had a very positive experience working for the president. Um, you know, I, I don't know if other presidents do this, but I can tell you what President Trump did when it came to personal time and family time. I remember I was um, on Air Force One with him, and just before that, we get on Marine One. So when you see the president walk across the, the blades of grass and they're blowing back and the press is shouting questions at the president, you know, we walk onto Marine One, and I get on with him on a Saturday. We're going to a rally, and there's a few people on Marine One, and he looks at me and he goes, why are you here? And I go, well, that's concerning from the guy who fires people. <laughs> like, and I go, well, I'm your press secretary. He goes, I know that, but why are you here? Don't you have something better to do? It's Saturday night, you have a family. And I go, yes, and he's like, well, what's your family doing now? And I said, well, my husband's a Major League Baseball player, and he might be pitching tonight. He's like, what? Your husband might be pitching, and you're here with me? And on Air Force One, he kept asking me the whole night, like, is Sean pitching? Is he, is he playing in his game? And I'm like, no, not yet. So we land back on Air Force One, Joint Base Sanders. We get on Marine One. He keeps asking about Sean, and he goes, you know what, Kaylee? Go in the Oval Office kick up your feet and watch your son play, or watch your husband play baseball. And I'm like, well, I'm not gonna do that. But it was very cool he said that. But the neat part of it was what he said after. He said, Kaylee, next time, next Saturday, I don't want you coming with me. I want you to go be with your husband and go be with your baby because that is important and that is what matters. And the fact that he said that to me said a lot about him. And I saw this side of him. You know, we all see the side where he tweets something he shouldn't or he says something he shouldn't. And, you know, people, of course, have their, their views on that. But, you know, I saw the person who, when Caroline Levitt, who's currently his press secretary, came into my office and we had started naming children who had been killed in local crime at the podium. We would say their names. We wanted to bring attention to their stories because of the violent crime epidemic. Um, Caroline Levitt came to me and said, do you think the president would send them letters? And I said, I, that's a great idea, I think so. And I went to the president, he said, absolutely. And he sent these families letters. One had the Joshua verse reference tonight about being strong and courageous, sent this to one of the families. And what an amazing moment when Caroline Levitt came back into my office one day and said, look at this Facebook post. And it was a Facebook post with basically no traction, but it was a parent saying, my child mattered. The president of the United States sent me a letter. He cared, thank you, 45. That's the president I saw, someone who cared deeply for the country, was willing to fight for the country, maybe too much at times, so you know, he could be a fighter, but he loves this country, cared about the country, and cared about the people within it. He just doesn't show that side of himself very often. Oh, that's awesome. So just two more questions here, and we're gonna wrap. And, and this first question, I w really wasn't planning, but I, my father-in-law here is here, so I have to ask this question in the world. 
They're in the tea right now. What in the world is Greg Gutfeld like when the cameras are off? <laughs> Like he, he's he, off. He, yeah, he's like we were. Well, I'll tell a story after. But what is that guy like actually behind the scenes there? He's <laughs> it, it is funny. He is one of the hardest working people, and it's funny. I have my office, and on one side of me is Jesse Waters, and the other side of me oh, is gosh. Greg Gutfeld. Good Lord. And Greg is the quieter one, believe it or not. Greg is. I never hear his voice in his office, but Jesse, I could I could sometimes hear him. But Greg is such a hard worker. I will say this. Um, you know, one time I brought my daughter, and for Fourth of July, because I was doing the Fourth of July special and I made the mistake of walking her through the Gutfeld area and they have all kinds of props there and my daughter picks up this severed arm this fake severed arm and goes mommy what's this and I go no that's Gutfeld come here yeah. <laughs> he's great though no, I no, love no, him I, I have brilliant the, brilliant man the, the, the funny story for this was that uh, this afternoon I was with our daughters and, and they were asking who's speaking and I said oh Kaylee's going to be speaking they said have we seen her before and my, my father-in-law has Gutfeld recording he was like oh I'll show you and you know Kaylee comes on screen and then it cuts over to Greg and I'm like nope turn it off can't, can't show him this, um, but uh, he's, Smart move. Good exactly, time. exactly. He's a lot of fun. The last question I just want to ask, um, I think for a lot of us that watch that debate, um, we, we've, and, and this has been a, a narrative for the last 10 years, um, but we're, we're watching the media fall deeper and deeper down this pit, even CNN. Um, the, the question is, is there any hope in redeeming what we're seeing in mainstream media today? And what should, I, I know for a lot of us, we see what's happening in the media and it almost feels powerless of how to sort of restore uh, just some common sense in the conversations we're having nationally on these issues. How do we go about doing that today? I mean, it's, it's a, that is a huge question and it's tough um, because notice the only time the media decided to report anything negative about the other side of the aisle was in the five weeks after the Trump debate with Joe Biden where they had an end game, which was to move Biden aside and to and put Kamala in. So that's when you know their, their true coverage came. All of a sudden, the leaks were everywhere from the Biden administration. Otherwise, you know they have an agenda and they cover for the administration. It's sad to see, it's unfortunate to see the ABC debate was shameful. Uh, those were two individuals who were quite obviously partisan. They only chose to do fact checks on one side and not fact checks on the other, despite there being all sorts of statements made by Kamala Harris. It's frustrating to see, but here's what I know, because during CNN, uh, my tenure there in 2016, there was something going on in the country and the media could not stop it. You know, CNN tried its best with their eight on one panels, eight Democrats and this lone little conservative me on the, on the outside. There was something bigger going on in the country. There was a movement that was being made, and I, I think that might be happening right now. I, I watched the post-debate coverage, and the media was just apoplectic in their, you know, deriding of Trump and their praise of Kamala Harris. But then I started to read, you know, the bottom of the New York Times. I love reading to the bottom of the New York Times, because that's where they bury all the news that's positive for Republicans. So at the bottom of this New York Times article was the voice of a woman named Keila Miller. She was a 39-year-old black woman from Milwaukee who said she was not planning to vote until she saw the debate. And her comment was, I believed more in his facts than her vision. And she said, I want to be a part of making history. Part of me wants to vote for Kamala, but he has facts. He has a record. He can lower my grocery bill. And I continued to read on and on, and I read about another man from a different part of the country, a swing state, who said something very similar. He wasn't planning on voting, uh, but he decided to because this is the candidate that would fight for him. This is the person that would make the economy better. And Trump has facts. She has a vision that is very light on the details, right? Um, so I have hope for the country. I have more hope than ever before. And today, you know, the, the guy who's driving me here said, I'm voting for Trump. My two daughters are voting for Trump. I'm an immigrant to this country. We're voting on Trump. I, I just believe that everyday Americans see things entirely different than the media. So the media, the left-wing media, is relegated to irrelevancy, and especially in the age of social media where people can have a voice in an unconventional way. So I'm very hopeful for the future of our country and pretty important 54 days coming up. That's right. Join me in thanking Kaylee McEnany. Thank you for tuning in to this episode of The Narrative, presented by CCV and produced by Westler Media. If you found today's episode insightful, leave us a review or rating and subscribe anywhere you get your podcasts. 
We're your hosts, Mike Andrews, Aaron Bear, and David Mahan, and we'll see you next time on The Narrative.